said, though you did not see the yield, you were faithful to plow the field. At other times you had me plant the seed. No matter how small the task, you did just Take our Bibles this morning and turn with me to the book of Revelation, if you would, chapter number 10. We've been going through this series uh, verse by verse, and uh, hopefully you found it of uh, interest and also maybe explain a few things that uh, were a little bit uh, difficult for you to understand previous, and hopefully uh, this morning will be the same. 
Revelation chapter number 10. We're going to read the entire chapter. There's 11 verses here for us. So once you've found that, if you could stand with me, we'll read from God's word. Revelation chapter number 10, verse number 1. And I saw another mighty angel come down from heaven, clothed with a cloud and a rainbow with upon his head. And his face was, as it were, the sun, and his feet as pillars of fire. And he had in his hand a little book, open. And he set his right foot upon the sea and his left foot upon the earth, and cried with a loud voice as when a lion roareth. And when he had cried, seven thunders uttered their voices. And when the seven thunders had uttered their voices, I was about to write, and I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Seal up those things which the seven thunders uttered, and write them not. The angel which I saw stand upon the sea and upon the earth lifted up his hand to heaven, and swear by him that liveth forever and ever, who created heaven and the things that are therein and on the earth and the things that are therein are and the sea and the things which are therein, that were should be time no longer. But in the days of the voice of the servant or the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound, the mystery of God should be finished, as he hath declared to his servants the prophet. And the voice which I heard from heaven spake unto me again, and said, Go and take the little book which is upon open in the hand of the angel, which standeth upon the sea and upon the earth. And I went unto the angel, and he said unto me, Give unto the little book. And he said unto me, Take it and eat it up, and it shall make thy belly bitter, and it shall be in thy mouth sweet as honey. And I took the little book out of the angel's hand and ate it up, and it was in my mouth sweet as honey. And as soon as I had eaten it, my belly was bitter. And he said unto me, Thou must prophesy again before many peoples and nations and tongues and kings. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word once again this morning. I pray that you'll speak to our hearts as only you can do. I pray that above all things today, thy name might be lifted up and glorified. And we want to exalt Jesus Christ today for who he is. What a blessing we have in 2024 in this place knowing that we can come to Jesus Christ have our sins forgiven and a home in heaven already prepared father I pray that if there's anyone here today that's not saved they'd see their need for the Lord Jesus Christ or perhaps if they're listening uh, later online they might have their heart strings uh, pulled by the Holy Spirit of God that would draw them to you that they too might come to know Christ the Savior Father, I pray that now you just anoint me afresh with the power of the Holy Spirit of God and that we have spirit-filled listening. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You may be seated. Question this morning, who is Jesus Christ to you? Who is he? Um, is he like your ticket to heaven? Is that all? Uh, is he uh, more than that to you? Jesus himself said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no man comes to the Father but by me. He says, I am the way. What way? The way to heaven, the way to life, the way to joy, the fulfillment of all of that you could imagine. He said, I am the way. Follow me. And then he says, I am the way, the truth. Now, if you're looking for truth in a very untruthful world today or a complicated world today, Jesus said, I am the truth. Come to me. And he says, you'll find the truth. And by the way, this book is truth. The Bible says in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, that is the Lord Jesus Christ. He said, I am the way, the truth, and he said, the life. And when we think about that, Jesus is much more to us that know him as our Savior than just a ticket to heaven. He is life. He gives life, the joy that comes with life, the pleasures of life, the, the focus of life, and the future that are behold us with our families and for our service to him. He is much, much more than just what we might term as a ticket to heaven. He is our God. He's a Jehovah Jireh. He's the King of kings, the Lord of lords. And can I tell you this? God loves you this morning. He cares about you this morning. You say, well, nobody loves me. Well, that might be uh, true, but God loves you. I know that for sure. God does love you. He loves you so much he made you. He knows you specifically. He knows your DNA. He knows your genetic code that makes you up. Um, he, he, he knows your eye color, the color of your hair, how many hairs you have. He knows your toes, your ears, your, your tongue. He, he knows your language, your height, where you live. He knows all about you this morning. He is not just a ticket to heaven. He's your savior. Uh, he, he is your friend. He is that brother to you. And he is our king, the Lord of lords. And he cares about you. And I wonder as we consider this text 
uh, this morning in Revelation chapter number 10. Do you see him? I want you to notice, if you will, as we look at verse number 1 through 3. And I, uh, and I saw another mighty angel come down from heaven, clothed with a cloud, and a rainbow was upon his head, and his face was as it were the sun, and his feet as pillars of fire. And he had in his hand a little book open, and he set his right foot upon the sea, and his left foot upon, or on the earth, and cried with a loud voice as when a lion roareth. And when he had cried, seven thunders uttered their voices. Now understand, as we look at chapter number 10, this is the darkest time in world history that's ever been known. It's a great tribulation. And we, as we've looked at the previous chapters, we've said how terrible it has been. It's that seven-year period of time after the rapture, the church has already gone up to meet the Lord in the air, and uh, it's when hell goes on a holiday, if you please, and all the demon spirits are loosed uh, uh, upon the earth in a way that has never been seen before, the most horrific coming up out of the river Euphrates. We talked about that. These demon spirits as he infests the earth and the Antichrist takes rule. And the people are tortured and die for their faith. There is no better time to get saved today, my friend, if you are not saved than today. Don't put it off. You say, I'll wait until after I see the rapture happen. Then I'll know it's true. Don't wait. If you wait until that time, it may be too late for you. For you will have to die as a martyr when you make the decision then. And you may not have the wherewithal in order to do that. Get it done while it's easy. Don't put it off. Do it while it's easy to get saved. And uh, I don't know about you, but I know I don't want to be here. And the good news is I, I know I'm not going to be here. And neither do you have to be here. Because God's given us the opportunity for salvation. You know, um, as humanity looks at this darkest hour and it looms like a, 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 a big cloud upon the minds of people, they see the... Um, horrific events going on. One quarter of the world population being killed. The uh, oceans turned to blood. The uh, uh, destruction of all the seafaring, uh, one third of the seafaring vessels, which I think we said was 330 plus thousand uh, sea vessels that are registered, or just over a million registered, but a third of those will be destroyed. As we consider this, uh, there's a beacon of hope, a brightness happens right here, chapter 10, verse number one. And at this point, in the middle of the tribulation, at the three-and-a-half-year period, um, you could call it a survey trip, I guess. Uh, this, this is not just another angel that we're being spoken of here. It's none other than the Lord Jesus Christ himself. He's executing like a divine touchdown, one foot on the earth, one foot on the sea, uh, at the end zone of this life. And we see him uh, in a way never seen before. You say, how do you know it's him? I mean, uh, it says angel here. Go to Revelation chapter uh, number 11 and verse 3. And I will give power unto who? My two witnesses. Who's speaking here? None other than Jesus Christ. And they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and threescore days clothed in sackcloth. These are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before God, uh, the God of the earth. Now, this is Jesus saying these are my two witnesses. Uh, the same, uh, remember, just because we went from chapter 10 to chapter 11, remember the Bible was not written in chapters and verses. Uh, it, it was broken up for us to easily understand and categorize things. But I believe that's him. That's Jesus Christ. Don't let it bother you that he's called an angel. Many times in the Bible, the Lord Jesus Christ has been referred to as an angel of the Lord. Uh, though he exists on a completely different level than the created angel beings, for he is their creator. Uh, he is the great I am, the Alpha and Omega. He is God. But remember, the word angel, you remember what it means? It simply means messenger. So when you say angel, uh, you know, we think of a spiritual being, of course, one of God's angels. It just simply means God's messenger. So here we see uh, the Lord Jesus Christ as the greatest messenger uh, uh, and the messenger of the new covenant. He is the gospel, but he also brought the good news to earth. In Genesis chapter 22, verse 15, it says, And the angel of the Lord called unto Abraham out of heaven. That's him. 
That's Jesus Christ being spoken of. In, in Isaiah chapter 63, verse 9, and then in Judges chapter 2 and chapter 6, chapter 21, chapter 22, we see Jesus in these passages as a pre-incarnate Christ. And in 2 Samuel chapter 24 as well. Because of his magnificence, we can see that this is Jesus Christ. When we look at the, uh, the explanation of this angel or the Lord Jesus Christ, he possesses many characteristics that belong exclusively to the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, I want us to notice four things in particular as we, uh, we open up this uh, portion of Scripture. Uh, in verse number one, notice what it says. And I saw another mighty angel come down from heaven, clothed with a cloud, and a rainbow was upon his head, and his face was as it were the sun, and his feet as pillars of fire. In scripture, clouds are a symbol um, often used in deity. Consider uh, Exodus chapter 16, verse 10. Uh, when God led Israel through the desert, there was a pillar of cloud that led them by day. In Exodus chapter 19, it speaks of dark clouds covering Mount Sinai when the Lord gave Moses the Ten Commandments and the voice of God thundered from within those clouds. In Exodus chapter 24 and, ver and chapter 34, God appeared unto Moses again in a cloud of glory. In Psalm 104 and verse 3, he, God, um, uh, maketh the clouds his chariot. In the New Testament on the Mount of Transfiguration, in Matthew chapter 17 and verse 5, it says, Well, he yet spake, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and a, behold, a voice out of the cloud which said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. In Acts chapter 1, Jesus ascended back to heaven. How? In a cloud, uh, with a cloud, and in Revelation 1, 7, Jesus says, Behold, he cometh with clouds. And so I say to you, that's him. That's Jesus Christ being spoken of here in chapter number 10, verse 1. Then we see, secondly, not just uh, uh, clothed with a cloud, but also crowned with a rainbow. Notice again verse number 1. And I saw another mighty angel come down from heaven, clothed with a cloud, and a rainbow was upon his head. And his face was as it were the sun, and his feet as pillars of fire. The rainbow is God's sign to man that he will never again destroy the earth with a flood. While this rainbow has appeared in Revelation chapter number 4, when John was called up to heaven, the first thing that he saw was the throne of God, and it was encircled by a rainbow. Um, and here in chapter number 10, it could be that... Uh, uh, although hell seems to be uh, all over uh, and, and it seems like Satan is in full control, we see this rainbow appearing uh, by this angel, which is Jesus Christ. John was called up to heaven. The first thing he saw, if you recall, a rainbow, you know, encircling uh, the throne of God. And th there in chapter number 10, in verse number 1, uh, could it be, even though as bad as it was happening, here on the earth at that particular time, and that is future tense, by the way. Uh, the clouds, the rainbow, uh, a reminder that he is the only one that could possibly make that kind of a promise that the world would never be destroyed again, but here he brings peace in the middle of a storm. I believe that's Jesus Christ. I believe in chapter number 10, verse 1, it's speaking of God's Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And then thirdly, we see his countenance like the sun. That's the signature of the glorified Christ. His countenance as a sun. Revelation chapter 1, verse 16. You remember, his countenance was as a sun shineth in his strength. Look at that, Revelation chapter 1, verse 16. And he had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was as a sun shineth in his strength. Now, you remember what we said, Revelation chapter number one is a description of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's all about a picture of who Christ is. Chapters two and three are the letters to the churches, and then in chapter four, we see uh, the church is not spoken again until um, chapter 19, because they have gone up into uh, the clouds to meet the Lord Jesus Christ in the air. And so here we see um, uh, very clearly uh, Jesus is being pictured in chapter 10, number 1, because of all of these elements that 
are being portrayed in conjunction, that no other angel is uh, portrayed that way. Uh, you remember in Matthew chapter 17, verse 2, his face did shine like the sun, um, and on the road to this Damascus, Paul, when he saw that, fell at the brightness of that noonday sun that he was seeing and was blinded for three days. The prophet Malachi uh, called Jesus the son of righteousness. He is a bright and morning star, described as a bright and radiant in his splendor. Um, the Shekinah glory, or the God Almighty, the streets of gold that were glimmering in heaven, the gates of pearl are radiant for sure, but Jesus will outshine all of those things because he is the bright and morning star, and yes, the sun. Later in Revelation, we're told there's no sun or moon in heaven. Uh, for the Lamb is the light thereof. And could I say to you that I present to you in chapter number 10, verse 1, this is him, that's him, that's Jesus Christ. And I don't know who Jesus Christ is to you. Can I tell you, when we look at his, the elements that surround him here, it ought to thrill you to think he's our leader, he's our God, he's our king, he's the one we follow. And then fourthly, we see him coming in judgment. Notice the last half of verse number one. And his face was as it were the sun, and his feet as pillars of fire. Now, uh, this section where it talks about pillars of fire, the feet being the pillars of fire, is clear reference to judgment, as brass and fire are both symbols of judgment. The judgment and the tribulation will become the most intense at this halfway period um, of the tribulation after three and a half years. Because the first three and a half years, it will seem like the Antichrist has got it all together. He's got answers for everything that's going on. What happened to the, the, the Christians when they were evaporated up out of the world? What happened uh, economically and politically around the world? He'll take charge, and so people will be watching him for answers, believing that perhaps he, as he sets himself up to be, a god. And as he has always wanted to from the beginning of time, when he fell from heaven, he said, I shall be like the Most High. See, that has always been his plan. He has always wanted mankind to worship him. He wants to take that away from the one and true and living God. Of course, it cannot be done. And we see here at the three-and-a-half-year period, uh, things have been going pretty good so far. The peace treaty made with Israel have already in, been enacted. But at the three-and-a-half-year period, he'll be seen for who he is and what he does as a traitor, He'll break that covenant with Israel, and then we'll see things get very, very intense and bad in the last three and a half years of the tribulation period. And so we see Jesus here uh, regarding judgment uh, with fire and wrath. And then uh, we see Jesus Christ stamps his feet upon two parts of the world as we know it. Um, you know, and we see at this halfway period, three and a half years, he takes and puts one foot on the earth and one foot on the sea. What's he doing? He's saying, I'm here to take charge. You know, this is my place, and, and he comes with judgment. Who is that that we talk of, clothed in, in a cloud and crowned with a rainbow in the countenance of the sun and coming in judgment? That's him. That's Jesus Christ because of his magnificence. Because of his might. Look at verses 2 and 4. And he had in his hand a little book open. And he set his right foot upon the sea and left foot upon the earth. And cried with a loud voice as when a lion roareth. And when he had cried, seven thunders uttered their voices. Jesus here holds the same book he held in Revelation chapter 5. Um, you recall the title deed to planet earth. Uh, that book that was, uh, no one was able to open that book to remove the seals, only one. There were many that would want to, the, uh, not any preachers or, or prophets, nor kings, or anybody else was worthy to open that book, only one, and that was Jesus Christ. Here we see him holding that same book again. It is a title deed to planet earth that was given over to Satan uh, at the fall of mankind in Genesis. So who is working uh, uh, over time here, well, the old Antichrist is because he knows what's coming and his days are short. But it doesn't matter. Jesus Christ steps in and the world will see him as he is. And then as we consider, who is worthy to open the book? The Lamb of God. 
That's him. That's Jesus Christ. And in a powerful and mighty gesture of his ownership in chapter 10, he stamps one foot on the, on the earth, one on the sea, symbolizing that he's taken possession, he's taking it back. Uh, he says, I have met all the requirements of the title deed, and we see those uh, seals being broken off one at a time with the, uh, the sealed judgments, with the trumpets and so on, and the, uh, the seal bowls. Um, Jesus is saying, this is my and I own it, every drop of water and every grain of sand, and I'm taking possession back, and he met all the requirements. When did he meet those? At Calvary. When he died upon the cross for the sin of mankind, mine, and for yours too. In Colossians chapter 1, verse 16, go there. Colossians 1, 16. For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible. Whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. He owns it all. One foot on the land, one foot on the sea, because from end to end, uh, from pole to pole, it belongs to him, all of it. The communist lands belong to him. The capitalist lands belong to him. The colonial lands belong to him. North America belongs to him. Uh, and, and has been before the Vikings or the Indians were ever here. He owns it all. He owns the Far East and every last bit of the Middle East. He owns the camels on a thousand dunes and all the oil underneath there as well. And he owns the great Arctic glaciers coming uh, uh, from the north and, and the Rocky Mountains off to our west. He owns it all to the eastern part of our country and the great oceans beyond it. He owns it all. And, and he owns uh, all that you can even imagine. So we need to just be careful here because he will be coming back to claim it as his own possession. And he will rule for a thousand years. And guess what? If you're born again, you'll be with him, ruling as well. Notice verse number three. He cries out with a voice of a lion. Uh, that's another symbol of his might. Notice what it says. And cried with a loud voice as when a lion roareth. And when he had cried, seven thunders uttered their voices. Remember, there's two sides to the character of our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. We see him as a lamb. He came first as a baby born in a stable in lowly situation there, uh, born to uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, Mary, being overshadowed by the power of the Holy Spirit. A miracle baby took place. Jesus was born, but not in the greatest of hospitals that he could have been in the time. He didn't go to the Four Seasons Hotel. He didn't go to uh, the Marriott. He was born in a stable. And he came forward as a, uh, as a lamb, but then we see the other side of our Savior, and that is a lion. And so we receive him as a lamb, or we face him as a lion if we reject him. He is our Savior. He loves us. He died for us. That's how much he cares for us. But if you don't receive him as your Savior, you will face him as your judge. He that wants to save you today will judge you on that day if you do not get saved. And the Bible says that the point of the man wants to die, and after that, the judgment. It is coming to every human being. One day, we must face him. I look at Revelation chapter 10, and I say to you, that's him. That's Jesus Christ here because of his magnificence and his might. And back to chapter number 4 and verse number 1, uh, prior to the tribulation, the trumpet sounds. Go to uh, Revelation 4.1. After this, I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven, and the first voice which I heard was, as it were, a trumpet talking with me, which said, Come up hither, and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. 
prior to the trumpet sounds and, and those of us who have been born again will fly away to meet him in the air, um, the magnificence of our Lord Jesus Christ is displayed that one of the clouds, um, well, we will be gone up into the clouds to, to meet him. Uh, we can look back and, 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 and see and we will say within ourselves, if not verbally, that's him. That's the one. That's my Savior. That's the one I've been serving all these years. That's the one I put my faith, my hope in for all these years. That's him. And in Revelation 10, verse 1, don't be confused. Because he is referred to as an angel, he is a messenger at this time. Question. When that time takes place, and I don't think it's too far away, I don't know the day or the hour. Nobody does. And uh, although we would all agree in this room, I think if everybody looked at it rationally, that our world has never been set before as it is today for Christ to come back. It could happen today. It could cap happen next week or next month or, or in the next 10 years. I don't know when, but I don't think it's going to be that long. Question, are you ready? Will you be ready to be caught up into the clouds when that th thunderous trumpet sound comes? Or will you be left behind? Maybe you'll find yourself in that situation. Maybe you've never trusted Jesus as your Savior. You've, you know how to do it. You've heard it over and over again, but you've never made him your Lord and Savior. You've never come to him and said, please forgive me. And maybe you will see uh, the church is evacuated up out of this world, and you'll be looking around wondering, oh, everybody's gone. And you'll say within yourself, that was him. I missed it. You'd be one of those that are saying, I know uh, why many have disappeared from the earth. It was my brother, my sister, or I was in church, and I heard uh, of these things that was going to happen one day. And I know why I've been left behind, because I never took the time. I never believed. I never put my faith and trust in him. And worst of all, I know what's still to come. A time of great tribulation, which uh, if I do get saved, I will be tortured, and I will die a martyr's death. Why didn't I do it when it was easy? Even that will not compare to the eternity of hell for those that reject Jesus Christ and have to spend an eternity separated from him. Christian Revelation 21 says that once the tribulation is over, after the battle of Armageddon has taken place, after the thousand years, uh, the millennial reign of our Savior, the millennial kingdom on the new earth, new heaven descends from heaven above, um, the new Jerusalem, eternity uh, begins. And for those of us who have been born again, verse 4 says that God wipes away all tears. Isn't that good? How many tears have you cried lately? How many times have you shed uh, tears for a loved one or a uh, co-worker or a neighbor, someone you've witnessed to, but uh, they seem dear to your heart and they never got saved, or at least they've not got saved yet. And how many tears have you shed for loved ones, family members that have gone on? How many times have you shed tears because of circumstances in your world? And yet, in verse number 4 of chapter 21, it says, God will wipe away all tears. Now, notice it doesn't say that an angel will do this. God's not going to send anybody else to do this. He will do it as your heavenly father himself. He'll wipe away all tears. But question is, wait a minute. Why are we crying? <laughs> Aren't we going to be in heaven enjoying all that we see? Could it be during the tribulation? We look down from heaven's portals of glory, and we see that co-worker. And we say within our hearts, oh, my soul. That's him. That, that, that's my coworker. Or the neighbor that lived uh, uh, on the same street, and you say, that's her. Or a family member, and you say, oh my, that's him, or that's her. Or a stranger that the Holy Spirit led you to witness to, but you never got around to it, and you never did, and you cry in regret from the depths of your soul, and you say, that's them. And yet I never spoke. I never took the boldness to tell them about Christ. I never gave them a gospel track. I never invited them to church. And you say within yourself, oh my, that's them. If you've never been born again, you have that opportunity today. Don't put it off. And if it's the only opportunity that you ever get, take hold of it today. Because we don't know that we'll go out of here this afternoon. We don't know if we have a car accident or we have a heart attack. We have no idea. It's a very fragile world in which we live today. If Satan convinces you to say no to the Savior, 
the Savior will say no to you when he returns. If the old devil can convince you to say, uh, I'll put it off till I get home, then he's won the battle because you probably won't. You'll probably get home and you'll get busy. You'll get distracted. The phone will ring or you get talking to somebody or it'll be time to make a meal. It just seems that uh, the moment will be gone when the Holy Spirit of God is speaking to your heart. You don't want to miss the opportunity. You'll know that this message is true one day, whether you have trusted Christ as Savior and you go up to meet him in there or if you are left behind and you cry out, that's him, <laughs> that's him. Question, have you trusted Jesus as your Savior? Now, I know everybody here. Today. I, I, I presume we have, but I never want to assume that ever because I don't know what's in the heart of the individual. Friend, if you're not saved, please get it taken care of today. If you're listening online, please don't miss this opportunity. It might be too late if you put it off. And if you're here and you need to be saved, you come and see me after the service, and I'll take God's word and show you directly beyond any shadow of a doubt that you could know. And if you were to die today, that you could go to heaven. And if you have been saved, but you know that you've got uh, many people that God's laid in your heart that you have not reached out to. God has motivated you time and time again to be his soul winner, and yet you are nervous about it, or you just never found the time because we live in a pressure cooker world. We're so busy all the time. Or maybe you felt in your heart you wanted to beg and plead, and maybe you wake up at the still, small place between sleep and awake. You're not fully awake yet, but you're not fully asleep, and you're thinking in your mind, certain people that you know that aren't saved. And maybe the Holy Spirit twigs your heart to pray for that individual. And maybe you take that opportunity to pray for them. But then by not taking the next step and sharing the gospel with them, you may be losing out on the opportunity. The most blessed thing you'll ever do, trust me, is to lead somebody else to Jesus Christ. If you've never done it, can I encourage you? You lead somebody else to Jesus Christ. When you turn around and you go home, you'll be walking on cloud nine. You'll be driving as if the whole world was new all over again. Why? Because you have just introduced somebody to new life. Would you be willing to give up your life for Christ today if it was necessary? To give him your all today? To put aside your own dreams and aspirations and your desires, your career and everything, say, God, use me, whatever it takes. It doesn't mean God will strip all the things away from you. No. But he's looking for you to give him, to use you to accomplish his great accomplishments around the world. And that is winning the loss to him. The most precious thing to God, the closest thing to God's heart is seeing people get saved. And you can have a part in it. Would you say, I'd be willing to be a witness? We'll make that commitment to him today. I'd be willing to take a track and hand it to somebody, then make a commitment to him today. Don't just say it within your, your, your uh, intellectual thoughts, but let it uh, sink down into your heart to say, okay, I cannot even go home until I give somebody a track or witness to somebody today. There is a great job to do, and it, it overwhelms me when I think of the mass number of people getting saved in other countries today. Ours is not one of them. Is it because God's people are not as fervent as they once been? No, I think that uh, spiritually things have grown cruel, no question in our country and uh, our neighbors to the south, but it doesn't mean that the Bible has grown cruel. The, the message, the gospel message is as pure and honest and good and wholesome as ever before and attractive. There's still something very attractive about the gospel. Friend, would you be willing to share it with somebody? For there are people out there looking for truth. There are people looking for hope. There's people looking for answers today. That answer is in the Lord Jesus Christ. The one we spoke of here in chapter 10, verse 1. And I saw another mighty angel with, uh, come down from heaven, clothed with a cloud and a rainbow upon his head, and his face was at where the sun and his feet as pillars of fire. That's him. That's the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, um, I wonder how many times we prayed for those that are unsaved. In Psalm 126, it says, He that goeth forth and weepeth. Question. Have you wept for anybody recently? Have you wept for that brother or sister or your mom or your dad or a cousin or an uncle or an aunt? Can I tell you, this is the opportunity of a lifetime, but we are only promised today. We don't know what tomorrow will bring. 
So who is Jesus Christ to you? Just a ticket to heaven? Or is he truly your savior? Can I tell you who he is? That's him in chapter number 10, verse 1. He's the great I am. He's the king of kings, the prince of priests. He's a strong and mighty tower, the creator of the universe and the holy one of Israel, the judge, the friend that sticks us closer than a brother, the pillar of fire by night and the cloud by day. And he is our advocate, our redeemer, our savior, the God child in Luke that came as a baby in a manger and the mighty warrior of revelation. And he is a rose of Sharon, the living word, the bread of life, the open door and the water of life. He is a light of the world and he is a still small voice that speaks to your heart today. He is the way, the truth and the life. He is a master of the sea and the great physician. He is the alpha and the be uh, omega, the beginning and the ending. He is a bright and morning star. He is a rock of ages. He is a sacrificial lamb and the lion of Judah and the most high. He is Jehovah Jireh. He is the Elohim, the day spring, uh, our shield, our fortress, our lifeline, Abba Father, our heavenly Father. He he is the only true God. There is none else. He is the Lord of all and the King of all, and there is none else. And he is alone fit to take the universe's throne, and he is God, and he is Jesus Christ. I love him today, and I hope you do. He cares for you. Friend, if you don't know him, today is a day. Receive him as your Savior. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this time that we have today. Pray that you'll bless each one as we go our separate ways today. Help us to remember to be a witness to folks that we come in contact with today, tomorrow, or throughout this week. Help us not to uh, just quickly discard uh, what we hear when we come to church, but apply it to our hearts that we can be an encouragement to others, that we can also share with them the truth of your word. Father, if there's one here that's not saved, I pray that they'll get that settled today or Perhaps there's someone here that hasn't witnessed anybody in a very long time. There may be Christians here that have never, ever won somebody else to Jesus Christ. I pray that, Father, today you'll put the desire within their hearts to reach out, to share the gospel. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.